In the one race in Colorado that still has America's attention, Republican Congresswoman Lauren Boebert has steadily built on her lead over Democratic challenger Adam Frisch. Boebert currently holds a 1,229 vote lead over Frisch. It's 50.2 percent of the vote. The Pueblo County Clerk's Office has suggested they have several thousand more votes to count there. Early voting, and therefore the early counting in Pueblo County, heavily favored Frisch. And then the ballot drops more recently from Pueblo became evenly split, and the last one went strongly for Boebert. Expect to be watching this race for days. First, campaigns will work to cure, to fix the signature issues from voters that they anticipate to be friendly to their cause. In fact, every voter identified as having a signature issue will be contacted by their county clerk to see if they'd like to fix it. And then military and overseas votes can still come in through November 16. Colorado is sending its first Latina to Congress. Historic victory for Dr. Yadira Caraveo, as her Republican challenger Barb Kirkmeyer conceded in the 8th Congressional District. The current vote count shows Caraveo, Democrat, ahead by less than a percentage point. The new 8th District was drawn to be competitive, drawn with the largest Latino population of any congressional district in Colorado. Our Steve Steger talked with Caraveo about making history. But Yadira Caraveo. In the backyard of the house where she grew up in Adams County, Yadira Caraveo made history. The first Latina elected to Congress from Colorado and the first representative of Colorado's new 8th District, drawn to maximize Latino representation. The moment that I realized that I could be the first Latina Congresswoman in Colorado was honestly some sadness at the fact that uh, in the state that's named in, in Spanish, that we had never had somebody who looked like me or who spoke like me. Representation is not lost on her family, especially and, mom. Uh, being the first Latina, oh my God, it's, it's so big for me. You know? Though she admits it isn't getting her out of her daughter duties. When she gets home, she needs to get down, you know, because if there's... Humbling. Yeah, because if there's issues to wash, you know, come on, do it, you know. Surveys of Latino voters prior to the election found they value being able to vote other Latinos into office. But pollster Gabe Sanchez says that's often just a bonus factor for a candidate, as he finds Latino voters evaluate candidates on their positions on issues first. It's not just the easy, they've got a Z at the end of their last name, so I'm going to support them. It's often that Latino candidates like this one typically do a better job of actually outreaching to Latino voters. Doors I've knocked on and first they say, oh, you know, I can't speak to you. I, I don't speak English and I can, you know, switch over into Spanish. And um, there's a glimmer uh, in their eyes of, of hope and, and pride. An exit poll of Latino voters from a Democratic leaning pollster released today found Latino voters favored Caraveo slightly more than Democratic candidates in other House races in the state, meaning the support of the district's largest voting bloc helped her win a very tight race, also proving the Latino vote isn't as predictable as politicos make it out to be. It's not monolithic. Latinos in Colorado are very different from Latinos across the country, um, and Latinos across the 8th District are different from one another. As for her priorities, health care is going to be one of those. Remember, Yadira Caraveo is a pediatrician by trade. She says she's had a lot of conversations inside her office that can lead to policy advancements. I asked her today, Kyle, what's one pledge that you can make to voters that you can come back and say, like, hold me accountable to that. She said, sure. the fact that I can listen. Got to remember, she's going to be one of 435. Yeah, one of 435 and might end up being in the minority if Republicans take the House. So there's not a whole lot she can say, I will get this done because so much is going to be out outside of her controls. It would be for anybody who is in the minority in Congress. It's interesting to hear her talk about her role in this. She says she's going to use her... Uh, her previous career as a driver in this as a doctor to say, like, I'm going to talk to people, I'm going to assess the problem and try to advocate for them. Maybe try to get some bills passed in the meantime, but we'll see what happens. Give them medicine they don't want to take. Yeah. 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 All right. Thank you, Steve. A few next viewers have asked what would happen if the vote counting in the 8th shifted in Kirkmeyer's favor after the concession, or in any race in that matter. Ken in Arvada, Gigi and Paonia were among those asking, what happens if a candidate concedes but then later goes on to win the race? It's a fantastic question. We should say a concession by, by a candidate or a party, that's not official. It's not binding. It's essentially just kind of a, a courtesy that moves the process along. The race, the winner is determined by only one thing, the vote count. Kirkmeyer has actually faced some questions from conservatives about whether she conceded too soon. She mentioned she's a staunch conservative, but Kirkmeyer is not an election denier. She's never been mixed up in that stuff, so we wouldn't expect any kind of games. And her team is determined that the race is over. In the past, though, candidates can and have rescinded their concessions. Most famous example would probably be Al Gore, 
who conceded the 2000 presidential election to George W. Bush, then changed his mind later that night. After the Florida recount and the Supreme Court decision in Bush's favor, Gore came out and conceded a second time. No matter where you work, there's, there's one moment that, that we can all identify with. The moment when you look around in boredom with your colleagues and realize, you know what? This meeting could have been an email. Colorado's House Democrats just held a meeting that resulted in practically nothing. The purpose was to pick a new Speaker of Colorado's House. Politics guy Marshall Zellinger got to sit through the meeting as well. I don't know, Mar Marshall, maybe Democrats were just so excited about their election night blue wave, they, they want to spend some time together. I mean, that's going to be a good answer because they could have waited for a while, and you'll learn that as we tell this story. The moral of the story, wait a week. Based on current election results, there are 46 Democrats projected to be in the state house. The problem is the House Democrats think three of those Democrats could still lose to Republicans. But those three Democrats participated today in voting for a new House Speaker, and apparently the results are within three votes, so the leadership election was put on pause to make sure everyone who voted today is really going to be a lawmaker. Uh, the next Speaker of Colorado's House will either be State Representative Adrian Benavides from Adams County, State Rep Julie McCluskey from Dillon, or State Rep Chris Kennedy from Lakewood. The reason I cannot tell you who the winner is is because of those three Democrats who are in races that the party is concerned could still flip back to Republican. One of them is a race in Colorado Springs separated by 596 votes. A race in Douglas County has a difference of 531 votes. And a race in Douglas and Arapahoe counties is separated by 908 votes. Oddly, there's an even closer race, one that's separated by 56 votes, but the Dems believe the outstanding votes in that district are in bolder blue areas. The point is, these three Democrats voted today to pick a new House Speaker, and the vote between the three candidates for House Speaker was within three votes. So nothing can move forward until the Democrats are sure everyone who voted today is really an elected lawmaker. Until those races are called, we are going to have to pause the leadership elections. Here's an idea. Wait until the vote counting is done in a week and then schedule the meeting. Meanwhile, Colorado House Republicans with the lowest number of members in party history, 19, I know I was playing with this, it should say 19, have selected a new leader to replace Hugh McKean, who died on October 30th. The party selected returning state representative Mike Lynch to lead the Republicans. He's from Wellington, and his district covers Larimer and Weld counties. His name may sound familiar because this past year, he co-sponsored the bill to make possession of small amounts of fentanyl a felony again. But then he dropped his name from the bill just before it passed, and he voted against it because law enforcement had concerns about the bill allowing someone to have their charge lowered to a misdemeanor if they could convince a judge they did not know their one to four grand of drug contain fentanyl. During his vote for me speech, he told his party, despite losing strength, they will hold firm. Number one, we're not going to ever veer from our Republican principles. That is, that is not what we do in the face of defeat that we had this week. Um, and we're going to promote those principles every single day. That is the job of this office. That was video of Lynch on a screen in the room where Lynch was speaking because all we could see was the back of his head from where he was sitting. After the meeting, I asked him what he meant by not veering from Republican principles. It, it means that this state is still suffering from high crime, still suffering from uh, inflation, uh, still suffering from an, uh, a fentanyl epidemic. I pointed out that voters knew that and still sent fewer Republicans back to the state house. He said those issues have not gone away. One other point. Despite having fewer Republicans in the State House, if you add up the votes of all 65 Republicans who ran for the State House, combined they received about 100,000 more votes than Republican gubernatorial candidate Heidi Gannon. Governor Polis outperformed the 65 House Democratic candidates by about 200,000, Kyle. So uh, you never want to refer to a candidate as generic, but they have that thing called the generic ballot where they say, who do you want to represent you in Congress, a Democrat or a Republican? But then at the end of the day, push comes to shove and you have to pick somebody with a name and a face and that kind of thing. But that said, not a lot of people in Colorado could even name who their Colorado House representative is. So it kind of like is a generic ballot. Like, do you want the Democrat or do you want the Republican? What that says to me is... Jared Polis is considerably more popular than a generic Democrat, and Heidi Ganahl is far more unpopular than a generic Republican. Sure, and I'm sure everybody knows someone who they're friends, family with, that say, hey, what is, who are these names on my ballot? I didn't expect them, and it was a state house or state senate race that they didn't know about. All right, Marshall, thank you. Colorado's legislators temporarily put differences aside today and gathered as one to pay respects to former House Minority Leader Hugh McKean.
As the respiratory virus has taken off among young children, Colorado's hospitals are preparing for the long haul. They're just not sure how long. Colorado's capital was filled with legislators today, those currently serving, those who have served in the past. Democrats and Republicans who gathered to remember former Republican House Speaker Hugh McKean, who died suddenly of a heart attack last month. If these hallowed marble halls could talk, imagine the stories that they would tell. Today, let them tell the stories of Hugh McKean and the indelible mark he left on this building and our hearts. It's hard to believe that we're saying goodbye to somebody who was so vibrant, energetic, and taken from us so early. You know, his laugh and his smile were infectious. Hugh McKean loved big. He loved everybody. As a public servant, minority leader Hugh McKean cared for his constituents and worked every day to bring their voices to the Capitol. He had a remarkable ability to connect with people making everyone from a gas station attendance to governors feel consequential. Friends, you don't get 60 bills passed and signed by a governor in this building by throwing stones. And I saw firsthand how he brought humility as well as a sense of humor and joy to his work. He loved being a legislator. He loved being a good friend. He loved all the staff in this building. And he loved being part of something greater than him. I think we can help finish Hugh's work beginning today in the here and now because it's pretty darn simple. Live like you, laugh like you, serve like you, and love like you. To do so, we would make Colorado imminently better and would truly finish his work. So my brother, I love you. Hugh McKean is the first state legislator to lie in state since Lieutenant Governor Joe Rogers in 2013. All righty, time to take a look at the forecast on this evening. A little windy out there in the Denver metro area, anywhere between 20 to 30 miles per hour right now. Look how quickly things start to dissipate and die down, though. Anywhere between 5 to 10 miles per hour by this evening, between 11 and 12 o'clock tonight. Temperatures out the door this evening in the middle 30s. Good evening, Denver, sitting at 35 degrees, really in the upper 20s and lower 30s. Fort Collins, just shy of freezing. As far as Kremlin goes, we're sitting at 25 degrees. And overnight low temperatures, they are no joke, my friend. We are dropping back down into the 20s. 24 degrees on your way out the door tomorrow. A few clouds overnight, and some of those clouds could produce a little bit of flurries, too. No accumulations, though. No problems. It's just going to be chilly. You'll certainly need your winter jacket on your way out the door tomorrow. And possibly a little bit of snowfall, too. There comes uh, a little bit of that, uh, or those flurries, I should say, uh, right across the I-70 corridor. And as we push into the early hours of tomorrow morning, once again, there are flurries at the very most. We're waking up to partly cloudy to mostly cloudy skies. The clouds start to clear uh, through the day tomorrow, and we're, uh, uh, we're looking forward towards temperatures in the upper 30s and lower 40s on Friday. Pushing into the 50s, though, on Saturday, not a bad weekend overall. Colorado's doctors say it's difficult to tell what's coming. As RSV is making kids sick, really sick, across the state. We don't have time to think about those issues. We have to deal with what we're seeing presently. What hospitals are seeing presently, and why they say it requires their full attention, next. What we're hearing from hospitals right now echoes what we heard during the peaks of COVID. They're talking about hospitalization spiking, crowded emergency rooms, and a lack of bed space. This time it's RSV, it's infants and children who are the patients. Arnusha Roy looked at the models to see how long it'll be before Colorado catches a break. To think about those issues, we have to deal with what we're seeing presently. Well, it sure seems like we're having an issue with that story. RSV can cause mild cold symptoms, some kids, but it can also sometimes become dangerous for infants, for toddlers. Usually it's kids under two. Older adults can sometimes struggle with it as well. One thing the doctors are saying right now is if it's not an absolute emergency, you don't necessarily have to rush a kid to the ER. There's nursing hotlines, also the ability to call your pediatrician, your family practice doctor. I'm going to step away and see if we can fix that story for you, huh? Let's try again to bring you Anusha Roy's report on the surge of RSV in pediatric hospitals. 
Doctors at Children's Hospital Colorado want to reassure parents no matter how busy they are. I don't expect any parent or even myself to be able to necessarily look at a child and say that's flu versus RSV versus um, the common cold or COVID. Yet that unpleasant swirl of viruses will be the reality for some time as RSV cases and hospitalizations are spiking higher and earlier in a way healthcare workers haven't seen before. And every day we see more than we saw the day before. Dr. Reginald Washington with the Health One system anticipates RSV cases will keep climbing for several weeks. And because this virus typically peaks between January and March, he's expecting it will stick around that long. He just isn't sure at what level. We don't have have time to think about those issues. We have to deal with what we're seeing presently. We're hearing a similar prediction from Children's Hospital Colorado. RSV will start going down at some point in the near future. Um, flu is right behind it. We also know that the pandemic has, has thrown things off quite a bit. So um, I agree with Dr. Carney. We would love to see a peak in RSV soon. But but if we look historically at, at previous seasons, we know that RSV levels do tend to stay high for several weeks. Hospital systems are bringing back protocol they learned about during COVID, but this time for kids, since most of the 554 people hospitalized in the metro area are children. We had the advantage of taking care of COVID patients, mostly adults, during that peak pandemic. So we have a... a if you will, a, a center set up where we look at all of this daily. We look at our supplies. We look at our staffing. For Next, I'm Manusha Roy. So again, doctors are saying before you take a kid to the ER, unless it's an absolute emergency, use a nurse hotline or, or reach out to a family practice first. Thanks for bearing with us while we fix that technical issue. Finish as always with your feedback. Bill wrote in with an extensive comment, but he proposes something interesting at the end. So let's hear it out. When we vote in Colorado, he says everybody knows who the candidates for governor are. Most know the candidates for Congress. But then there are pages of candidates for other offices. Bill said, I suspect some voters vote along party lines. That's what Marshall and I were talking about. It's almost kind of like that generic ballot. You, know, you want an R or a D, you know, even if you don't know the name. Bill says, I think the R and D after candidates' names should be removed from the ballot. Curious what you think about that. You know, shoot me an email at next at 9news.com. Does that help the problem? That create even more chaos. People just not vote the end of their ballot. You take off the R and the D. I don't know. Next at 9news.com is the email. See you next time.